Hi all, thank you for attending my session on mistake literacy. Now, mistake literacy is a theoretical construct designed to support students and faculty members recognize, react to, and repair their mistakes. But today's presentation is about taking this theoretical construct and making it accessible, applicable, and concrete. The crux of today's session will revolve around why it's so important for us to encourage our faculty to experiment and how to create the conditions wherein such trial and error is not only likely, but is likely to lead to learning. I'm Zach Cohen, the middle school director at the St. Francis School here in Louisville, Kentucky, a non-denominational progressive independent school. I'm also a consultant and blogger for the Core Collaborative, and if you'd like to connect with me or follow me, I can be reached at my Twitter handle or email addresses, both of which I'll enter into the chat. This session, as with all sessions during this conference, is intended to empower us to support our teachers, both as people and learners. And this is where I wanna to start today. How are we supporting our faculty? More than ever, our role has evolved to become some blend of clergy, therapist, leader, and listener. Accelerated, accentuated, or perhaps just exacerbated by the onset of the pandemic, we are tasked with these myriad responsibilities. Faculty morale is now very much a predominant facet of our job. Rightly or wrongly, our success is now inextricably linked with our care and concern for faculty well-being. This isn't a surprise to any of you. This is what we've been dealing with for a year now. What might surprise you, though, is the efficacy of the array of initiatives and one-offs we as school leaders have pursued to boost morale. At a time when we are so thinly stretched, when time, energy, effort are at such premiums, we need a return on our investment. Unfortunately, most of what we as school leaders have done to try to boost faculty morale has had a negligible effect. In a recent NAIS bulletin, this essential practice of supporting faculty and staff was highlighted. When I first saw these data, I approached it as a checklist of sorts, seeing what I had done and what was still left for me to do. In all, after running down this list, I felt pretty good about what I had accomplished or what was already in the pipeline. I was starting each of my days by expressing my gratitude to the faculty through handwritten letters that I placed on their desks. We lightened our meet and load by canceling faculty meetings that we deemed even remotely frivolous. We put in place guidelines for emailing, which asked that nobody send emails to our faculty between 8.30 a.m. and 5.30 p.m., thus permitting our faculty to set limits, disconnect, and recharge with school far from their minds. We extended holiday breaks, brought in food trucks, hosted trivia nights, had a masseuse come in, and strongly encouraged faculty members to use the increased numbers of faculty, or excuse me, of personal days. Now, I don't imagine that what I'm sharing here rings unfamiliar, as my understanding is that schools around the country are finding their own ways to do just this. I even know of one school that paid their faculty a $1,000 bonus in recognition of their hard work. Interestingly though, what we've learned is that whether it's a $1,000 bonus, an additional vacation day, or expressions of gratitude, the corresponding morale boost is ephemeral. There might be a momentary bump, even a significant increase, but that soon enough, faculty morale reverts back to pre-initiative levels. In fact, there's almost an inverse correlation between faculty morale and the actions that school leaders have taken to boost it. A quarter of teachers are experiencing their highest stress levels at the same time that NAIS school heads have reported on the myriad things they've done to ameliorate faculty stress. It seemed that gratitude, gifts, events, and the like are serving merely as temporary stopgaps, band-aids to a much more enduring dip in well-being. So considered through the lens of a professional context, what is causing this dip in well-being? Well, the novel and challenging circumstances of teaching during a pandemic have widened the distance between effort and outcome. The same effort will no longer produce the same results. By trying to straddle this growing divide, the faculty is feeling heightened levels of fatigue, stress, and anxiety. And how could these things not be correlated? Consider how the goalposts have shifted since we all went remote back last March. We mastered Google Classroom only to find our school move into a new LMS. We learned best practices for remote instruction only to find them obsolete when we moved to a hybrid instructional model. We optimized learning at six feet apart only to find that two mid-year transfers would be joining our class starting next Monday. Suddenly, we have all found that this, prof excuse me, this profession that we've known so intimately for decades has begun to evolve at a rapid pace. 
And through all of these shifts, the faculty is on display in a way that they never have been before, whether it's lessons being recorded and posted or synchronous sessions for our distance learners. The inevitable minor mistakes that we make as we gain mastery over new technology and new pedagogy is magnified by the specter of parents and administrators being privy to our every imperfection. A Starbucks gift card is not going to help teachers navigate these heightened levels of vulnerability because grande frappuccinos are not what our teachers are craving. Our teachers want to know that in spite of the way that conditions have conspired to create such challenging circumstances for our students, that they remain effective. Teachers are dropping off homework in fast food drive throughs providing extra help on Saturday mornings, and working 12-hour days because they want to find creative solutions to outwit and outperform the negative effects of the pandemic. Now, I don't know about you, but I continue to remind my faculty that there are times this year when they can give me a C-plus effort rather than an A. The thing is, no matter how many times I repeat this, the faculty will not seem to compromise the high standards they set for themselves. In normal circumstances, teachers aren't comfortable giving a C-plus effort. And now, as we see inequalities exacerbated and achievement dipping, our faculties are less willing than ever before to give anything short of an A effort. It's this knowledge that an A effort is translated into A results for their students that motivates teachers. Their professional happiness isn't derived from days off and food trucks. Rather, it emanates from that point of confluence where passion, autonomy, and competence meet. Unfortunately, passion, autonomy, and competence are not exactly the foremost feelings amongst our faculties these days. So how do we recapture and reignite these feelings? Well, one way is by cultivating a culture of experimentation, that being a culture wherein we encourage, even celebrate, appropriate risk-taking, mistake-making, reflection, and iterative growth. All we have right now is experimentation. Under normal circumstances, we'd have data, research, experience, meta-analyses to tell us what works. Unfortunately, there is a gap in the research. We simply do not know how translatable pre-pandemic findings are to pandemic teaching. This leaves us in a storm without a compass. As with a storm, we can't just wait around for research to once again guide us and lend direction. Given the real-time needs of our students, our teachers have to become learning leaders they need to be the ones to reconcile this knowledge gap themselves. Doing so requires our teachers to grow comfortable and confident experimenting. On a road without signposts, the only way to figure out how to get where we want to go is by venturing down one path, seeing where it takes us, and then putting up a signpost of our own, one that reads, follow me or stay back. The thing is, the failure that is so embedded in a process of trial and error is not one that most teachers are comfortable with especially at a time when they are under such scrutiny. This is where we come in. For our teachers to figure out what works, we have to figure out how to support them through the messiness of this process. Rather than trying to attend every webinar, read every blog, or endlessly scroll Twitter in search of that panacea, that one piece of research that will unlock effective pandemic teaching for our faculty, what we need to do is focus on creating an environment wherein our teachers can confidently go find answers without burning out. And that's what we're gonna jump into in just a minute. But before we get into the meat and potatoes of this presentation, let's review our learning goals, learning outcomes, and the various ways that you can engage in today's learning. In today's presentation, I'm going to discuss experimentation as an outgrowth of creating the conditions for mistake making and mistake learning to occur. In doing so, we will introduce the theory of mistake literacy, but we will focus less on the theoretical aspects of it and more on some actionable and attainable things you can do to create a culture of experimentation. As participants, you're gonna leave this presentation knowing one, how to establish a culture that values and encourages experimentation, two, how to establish the foundational teaching and learning conditions that nurture experimentation, and three, how to exploit what's working and explore what isn't. Now, there are going to be a couple of ways to engage in this presentation. The first is that you can simply add quick comments or clarifying questions using the chat feature. The second is that every time you see a Padlet icon in the bottom left-hand corner, there are seven in all. You can click on the Padlet link that I've added into the chat 
to anonymously respond to a corresponding question. Padlet icon one corresponds to question one, for example. Third, if you are active on Twitter, you can post your learning using the hashtag mistake literacy. As you can see, there's a Padlet icon on this slide. So if you'd like, you can go to the Padlet to reply to this first question. Now, right after I graduated from college, I accepted a volunteership to teach English in rural China. Mind you, I had never taken Chinese. I had very little knowledge of the culture and even less knowledge of the language. When I arrived, my liaison took me out to show me around the town. It was an especially hot and humid day, so we stopped to grab a Coke in what was basically the equivalent of a bodega. I insisted that I try to communicate with the shopkeeper since I'd soon enough have to do this on my own. Now equipped with no language skills whatsoever, I tried to pantomime a drinking gesture and repeated over and over, Coke, 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 and... After some befuddlement, the shopkeeper indicated that she understood what I meant. She left the counter and went behind a curtain. When she came back, she had a bowl of small dried fish in her hand. She put this on the counter and she rang me up. In that moment, I realized that I needed to learn Chinese. I went back to my apartment, took a short nap, woke up and began my learning journey. I took a notebook and a pocket dictionary and I headed out into Shangtan. I did the same thing every day for months. I hopped onto a bus at random, rode it until I saw something out the window that caught my attention, got off, and began to speak with people. After a few seconds of conversation, I'd hit a roadblock. There would be something I'd want to communicate that I just didn't know how to. I'd make a note of this in my notebook, and I'd head home. That night, I'd use the dictionary to learn what I wanted to say. The next day, I'd venture back out, and each day, I was able to speak for a few additional seconds. Each day, during these first few months, I actively sought failure. I intentionally brought myself to the edges of my knowledge and leaped gleefully into that learning pit below. That night, I'd pull myself out of it, only to jump right back into it the following day. In this instance, failure was fun. It was exhilarating. It brought me joy. Mistakes were not something I feared, but rather something that illuminated all that I had left to learn. They were something that I was in pursuit of. For me, fear was no longer a headwind. It became a tailwind propelling me forward. This is not a simple thing for us to instill in our teachers. Mistakes are scary, truly they are. But interestingly, it's not failure that most people fear when it comes to mistake making, rather it's unknown outcomes. In one recent study conducted at University College London, psychologists devised an experiment in which participants had to decide between a series of gambles with guaranteed rewards and a set of bets with potentially higher wins and losses. Based on this, they found that people were unable to estimate the best probable reward. The implication of this risk aversion is that if you are particularly anxious about failing, it's the uncertainty about whether you will fall that bothers you more than the actual consequences. What this finding tells us is that people believe that their success isn't about doing something good, but instead about not doing something bad. When we feel uncertainty around outcomes, we begin to fear failure. And when we fear failure, the process of experimentation begins to feel like an exhausting slog. With all our energy focused on not tumbling over the cliff rather than on the learning we can gain through the process. The thing is that when astronomers started discovering inconsistencies in Aristotelian theory, their understanding of the universe got a whole lot more confusing before it got clearer. When you redo your kitchen, things look a lot messier before they look nicer. Messiness is part of the experimentation process. What we need to do is clarify the fog of uncertainty that holds people back from experimentation. When we think of teaching and learning these days, we should think of it as a heuristic tool, an approach to problem solving, learning and discovery that is not guaranteed or even meant to be optimal, but is rather meant to be a journey towards figuring out what works best for our times, our context, our students, and ourselves. With such a mindset, we can more easily excuse me, create the conditions and encourage and celebrate risk taking, knowing that the resulting mistakes can help to blaze a path for future successes. Of course, the value of mistakes in this context is predicated on those who make them being versed in how to actually learn from them. While we, as school leaders, may be the purveyors of change initiatives, our faculty are the practitioners. So we have to find ways to enable our faculty to learn from the mistakes that are bound to be made when trying something new. 
something that is not a promised byproduct of mistake making itself. This is where mistake literacy comes in. Mistake literacy is about becoming fluent in how to learn from mistakes. Specifically, it is a mindset comprised of a suite of dispositions and non-cognitive skills that work in tandem to optimize learning by building students' capacity and capability to recognize, react to, and repair their mistakes. Now, mistakes come in all shapes and sizes, so it's important for us to make sure we're on the same page about which type of mistakes we're talking about here. While mistakes might be evidence of effort, mistake literacy is about engaging with and correcting mistakes so that effort translates to learning. For learning to occur, mistakes cannot be haphazard or flippant, but must be legitimate attempts at a new task or an investment in the development of a new skill. These mistakes occur because learners have pushed themselves to the edges of their knowledge or experience. Such mistakes, which are the unavoidable byproduct of learning, expose gaps and raise questions and open the possibility for reflection and analysis. Through this form of mistake making, learners develop a theory of what's correct, apply it, and revisit it as necessary. Thus, mistake literacy implies more than just awareness, it implies action on behalf of the learner. In this way, mistake literacy is about making the most of what is natural and unavoidable to the learning process, the process itself. While creating a fully operational culture of mistake literacy is something I consult with schools on and something we could unpack in a longer and larger presentation, today's goal is to provide just a few small tips for how to begin doing so. Let's talk about how we can get teachers to make the most of the learning process by positioning them to learn from their forays into experimentation rather than fear its uncertainty. Let's start by talking about exploration and exploitation. Now, when I first stepped onto a college baseball field, I knew almost right away that I was out of my depth. I had come from a small independent school that played against other small independent schools. In this conference, I was able to be effective with nothing more than a four-seamer. Armed with a fastball and really nothing else that merits mentioning, it took about 10 minutes into that first fall practice to recognize that if I wanted to earn play in time, I'd have to develop a secondary pitch. The trouble was that I didn't know how to. I possessed the drive, but not the know-how. At first, I tried to figure it out myself. Like most people, I had some measure of ego caught up in my identity and I wasn't willing to simply go hat in hand to a teammate for advice. Well, after a fall season where I struggled to get outs, I realized that I really had no other choice. Fortunately, I was surrounded by talented teammates. One of my teammates, a junior who would go on to set multiple school records in both soccer and baseball, had a vicious cutter and a deceptive changeup, and I figured that he was probably the person to learn from. When I approached this teammate after a winter practice to ask for his help, he replied with his patented bluster, what took you so long? This teammate showed me the grips for his cutter and changeup. Before and after practices that winter, he would throw on a mask and squat 60 feet away from me. He would catch a few pitches, then call out small pointers and corrections. After a winter of work, I went into the spring season armed with a viable secondary pitch, a changeup that the bottom dropped out of. I was never going to be the best pitcher on the team, far from it, I can assure you, but thanks to this peer mentorship, I was able to carve out a place for myself in the bullpen for the next four years. Now, this tale is not unique in the world of sports. Athletes sit in dugouts and locker rooms and exchange tips, tricks, and routines. Teams bring veteran players onto rosters every year simply to set an example for the younger players. Across sports and around the globe, athletes recognize and understand the importance of identifying what works and finding ways to exploit it to improve their own performance. There's a lesson to be learned here for educators. In much the same way that no player is ever going to make every shot they take or hit a home run every at bat, we know that being the perfect educator is an elusive concept. Rather, we're learners seeking to always improve our practice. Doing so requires us to strike a balance between two forces in learning, exploration and exploitation. When something we are doing isn't having the desired outcome we want, we want to explore why this might be, identify resources, and see what we want to modify or change. When something is working, we want to exploit these tactics, generalizing and scaling them to impact learning beyond our classroom. When we pursue exploitation, we are relying on the efficacy of existing knowledge. In contrast, the process of exploration 
speaks to the search to develop more meaningful knowledge. Back in college, I sought to exploit what had worked for me in high school, but quickly learned that the circumstances called for exploration. In this case, finding a mentor to help me progress. I sought superior solutions to reconcile my knowledge gap and began to integrate this newfound knowledge into my own practice. As school leaders, we want to encourage both exploration and exploitation in our buildings. All educators have things they can learn from their colleagues. Equally, all educators have things their colleagues can learn from them. We have to create the conditions wherein teachers can learn from and share with one another. Our job is to figure out how to create the conditions in our building for exploration and exploitation to exist. Each school is going to need you to do things a little bit differently, but there are some things I've tried that others might be able to do and exploit. First, cover classes. Feelings of inadequacy are going to run rampant as we reopen, and we all know that our teachers aren't likely to knock on our door and share such feelings with us. To account for this, I would encourage school leaders to cover classes. When you cover a class, instruct that teacher to observe a colleague, one from whom they think there's something to learn. This peer-to-peer -peer observation requires no follow-up on your part. It's a chance for teachers to go explore what is working elsewhere. The second piece of advice, set up a virtual help desk. Sometimes we know what we need to work on, but are reticent to go to colleagues to, with questions. It's not easy to be vulnerable. As school leaders, we can account for this by creating a virtual and anonymous help desk. Consider creating a Padlet or a similar virtual space and sharing it with your teachers. In this space, teachers can anonymously post questions or problems of practice they might be having and can source solutions from their colleagues. Third, have teacher-led faculty meetings. As you make the rounds, note what you see that is positively impacting learning. Later, ask that teacher to share what you observed during the start of a faculty meeting. Each week, you should have one faculty member share. This gives colleagues the chance to hear what's working, even if they didn't realize this was something they were seeking to explore in the first place. Sometimes we don't know what questions we have until we learn the answer. Unfortunately, there's no playbook to guide us through such a novel time in education. To find what works, we need to encourage our teachers to embrace the complementary processes of exploration and exploitation. Next, let's remind ourselves that iteration is innovation. Experimentation isn't about big transformative changes to our practice, but is about a series of small changes that have a big impact. It's about making small tweaks, evaluating their efficacy, reflecting, refining, and activating. When encouraging your faculty to engage in experimentation, remind them to start small. Getting started is hard, especially if what you wanna change is something huge like your teaching philosophy or curriculum. It's better to start with smaller ideas such as introducing a learning menu or developing an exit ticket. Reconsider the things about your practice and lesson design that you have long taken for granted and assess them as dispassionately as you can. Then with these low stakes, engage in the change process. Ultimately, experimentation should feel manageable and accessible. Now, you might be thinking that small changes will have a limited impact, but the thing is, experimentation is a virtuous cycle. It strengthens with each pass through. The more that teachers experiment, the more confident they'll feel in the experimentation process, which will lead to further experimentation. Your job as a school leader is to set teachers on the course of experimentation by pointing them in the direction of small attainable changes, helping them find success as they make these small changes, and then get them out of the way. Teachers will take it from there. Of course, we have to convince teachers that small changes are precisely what we have in mind when we talk about and encourage experimentation. One way to help teachers know that you're for real is by making careful and deliberate choices around what you choose to spotlight and celebrate. Remember, it's not about success and failure when it comes to experimentation, but rather the process itself. With this in mind, I had a teacher try to use Google Meet breakout rooms basically the day Google opened this feature. It went horribly wrong. She called me to share how poorly things went. She was calling really only because she was concerned that I might get calls from parents. It went that horribly. You can imagine her surprise a couple of days later when at a faculty meeting, I shared her story of experimentation and passionately expressed my gratitude for her willingness to try, learn, and grow. Everyone on the mute meet unmuted to applaud her efforts. Needless to say, 
She doesn't need me to convince her anymore of my beliefs around the value of experimentation. The third thing I want to encourage you to do is over communicate. I'm not talking about scheduling details and logistics. I'm talking about your belief system. If the faculty doesn't know what you believe, they are never going to feel comfortable taking risks because there's innate uncertainty about how you'll respond, which if we're honest, factors into many of the decisions our faculties choose to make. For me, I authentically believe in the importance of experimentation in general, and especially right now. This is something I share with my faculty as frequently as possible, because I know that they need to hear it from me over and over again if they're ever going to internalize and act on it. When we were remote, I wrote a daily note to my faculty every afternoon. The notes ranged in length, but the theme was always some variation on three things. First, there's no silver bullet when it comes to teaching and learning. Second, effective teaching and learning is going to be different to everyone. Third, it's going to look different according to discipline and grade level, right? Fifth grade math should look different than eighth grade PE. And for the faculty to learn what works for them, their grade level and their discipline, experimentation and trial and error is essential. I also write a lengthy email to the faculty every Sunday. This email is called Welcome to the Working Week. It contains all of the information that the faculty would need to know for the upcoming week. Things like special schedules, field trips, changes to supervision duties, but it also contains a section called End Finally. This is a space for me to share my own thinking about education. It's a space I often use to reiterate my beliefs about experimentation. As I wrote to the faculty a few weeks back, there is no perfect path and no perfect outcome when it comes to this work. Rather, there is experimentation, reflection, and iteration in the pursuit of improvement. As a division, our culture should revolve around improving, not proven. Finally, when it comes to over-communicating, we want to remember that it's always important for us to put a face to our words. When engaging with faculty members in one-on-one -on -one meetings, I constantly reference what I've written in Welcome to the Working Week. Hearing it has a different effect than reading it. Experimentation is a messy process, and our faculty is never going to be comfortable engaging in this work if they are 100% sure that you are behind it. That when they mess up, which they will, that you will not chastise them for it. To quell this concern, we cannot rely on a single point of communication. We need to communicate in an ongoing and recursive manner, and we need to do so in both writing and in person. The fourth thing to remind us of is that what we do and why we do it will not matter if we fail to consider how we do it. There are certain ways for us to approach this work that are most effective. First, be humorful. You see, people have been conditioned to respond to their mistakes through a series of maladaptive coping mechanisms, ranging from blaming to justifying to ignoring, all of which we know inhibit learning from occurring. We all know that these responses are exacerbated when we as school leaders display aggravation, annoyance, or antipathy in the face of mistakes. As school leaders, our goal has to be to switch our own dispositional response to mistakes. And one way to do this is by infusing our own with a little bit of humor. The research has found that humor can positively influence learning after a mistake. Humor has a much more disarming, leveling, humbling, and most importantly, comforting effect than many might admit. A professional playfulness can relax tensions and create a more collegial atmosphere for content exploration. If handled properly, humorous moments can offer a springboard for inquiry. School leaders set the tone for learning in the building. So when we approach mistake making with a sense of humor, it can translate into those around us doing the same, chuckling at their own absent-mindedness before embarking on the serious work of learning. Second, be curious. Experimentation is going to lead to an uptick in mistake making. When mistakes are made, respond with curiosity. The research shows that curiosity is not one thing, but is made up of many things. These dispositions that underline curiosity are what have been termed stable traits. Rather than respond to mistakes with volatility or emotion, we should instead respond with the stability of curiosity. The corollary to the endless diversity of mistake making is the endless possibilities for learning. It's only logical that every type of mistake has a unique pathway counterpart that would enable learning to occur. So rather than respond reactively, let us approach mistakes with, with the sort of stable traits that will help facilitate learning as opposed to deter our teachers from it. Third, be available. When teachers make mistakes or fail, they're going to come to you. 
This work is emotional and personal, and our teachers will need someone to process their feelings with. Be that person. I had a teacher the other day interrupt a meeting I was in with tears in her eyes. She had hit a roadblock in trying to develop personal learning pathways, and her emotions and negative self-talk spiraled from there. I left my meeting and spent the next 20 minutes or so working through this block with her. If we're going to ask our teachers to fail, we need to be available for them when they feel like failures. They need to know that we are available to them at all times. Fourth, we need to be the lead learners in the building. Teachers need to see that we are victim to our own device and advice. We can't ask others to deal with the ups and downs of experimentation if we ourselves refuse to experiment. Experiment and do so publicly. I did this when trialing a new virtual learning space called GatherTown. I'd been encouraging my, fa my teachers to try Gather, and so I decided that we would hold a faculty meeting in the Gather space. I invested the time to create the Gather space, and we held our meeting there. Now, did things work out perfectly? Definitely not. But I showed that I wasn't deterred by these errors, just curious about how to resolve them. We want our teachers to see us experimenting, failing, learning, and growing just like them and alongside them. In fact, we should be the person in the building most and most publicly engaged in this process. Finally, we need to lend our teachers our fierce support. Teachers need to know that when they fail, we are going to support them when a parent complains. If teachers feel like we are going to hang them out to dry when a parent complains about something like breakout rooms going awry, they are never going to be willing to experiment again. Instead, we need to show them that we have their backs. The additional burden of time and responsibility of the experimentation process cannot fall squarely and only on the shoulders of our faculty. If we are the ones encouraging our teachers to experiment, we better be there when such experimentation is called into question. During this presentation, we've learned that an extra day of vacation isn't going to boost faculty morale in any sort of enduring way. Think of such initiatives as soul candy, not soul food. Rather, we want to be pragmatic in the sort of support we are offering. The truth is, we don't know when we're going to be on the other side of this pandemic, and adding days off or throwing money at our faculty isn't sustainable. Instead, we should be seeking strategies that address the core of our faculty's professional distress. Effort and outcome are two sides of an ever-growing divide that is resulting in more mistakes being made at a time when those mistakes have never been more public. Mistakes, especially when seen by a parent or boss, have a nasty tendency to leave us feeling embarrassed, even humiliated. In part, this is a result of their feeling so final. When we know how to learn from our mistakes, however, we are permitted to change our perspective, perceiving mistakes as an inevitable and essential part of the experimentation process. This shift is one that takes time, but there are things we can do to help teachers make the most of the learning process by positioning them to learn from their forays into experimentation rather than fear its uncertainty. This includes exploration and exploitation, reminders that small changes can make a big difference, the importance and value of over-communicating, and how we can approach this work with our faculty. As based on your learning, how might you use these strategies to support your faculty in a way that is both enduring and empowering. This brings us to the end of our presentation. Remember, if you're interested in learning more about how to create a culture of mistake literacy in your building, reach out via Twitter or email. I'll also stick around on the chat, Twitter, and Padlet if you'd like to keep the conversation going. Thanks for listening. Enjoy the rest of the conference.